Chapter 11 Spain Inertia and Reaction The lag of Spain's political and economic development behind that of the rest of Europe meant that familiar problems would arise in the peninsula later and in a different guise than elsewhere in the West. The First World War was followed by bitter social struggles, and most Spaniards agreed that fundamental reforms were needed to haul the country into the 20th century. Instead of reforms, however, the country got Primo de Rivera, whose old-fashioned military dictatorship, in brackets 1923 to 1930, end brackets, kept things jogging along in a conservative vein. Authoritarian, patriotic, and anti-parliamentary, Primo de Rivera was a great admirer of Mussolini. But his power was not as solidly established as that of the Italian dictator. It lacked the basic support of a disciplined party, and also the fascists' unscrupulous organization of power. The end of the 20s found the country bankrupt. The reserves built up during the years of wartime neutrality spent, and the goodwill that the dictator enjoyed among the aristocracy, the army, and the upper classes ebbing fast. At the beginning of 1930, Primo de Rivera resigned, and the dissatisfaction he had stifled while in power rose up to engulf the throne. In spite of having discarded his dictator, the king's situation became more difficult. Municipal elections held in April 1931 returned a majority of Republicans and showed that the discredit of the dictatorial years reflected on the monarchy itself. Within a few days, Alfonso XIII left the country, in brackets, although he did not abdicate the throne, end brackets, and the Republic was proclaimed in Madrid. The new Republic, which took over in the thick of a world depression, was from the first beset by serious difficulties. Autonomous tendencies, especially in Catalonia, Catholic opposition to a regime which separated church and state and secularized the latter, hostility of an army leadership inflated in numbers and in self-importance, resenting policies that cut down both its credits and its size. A country whose new constitution and representative institutions needed running in would find it hard to cope with its most pressing problems, particularly unemployment, the violence of long-suppressed extremist parties, and the burning issue of land reform. A measure of land distribution was voted but was slow to be put into application. The peasants occupied the lands and had to be driven off by the forces of a regime they thought would free them. Meanwhile, the activities of communists, socialists, anarchists, and of the separatists in the Basque provinces and Catalonia threatened the unity and stability of the land. National Syndicalism It was during this period that a number of small, extremist nationalist movements appeared which would provide the theoretical and organizational groundwork of Spanish fascism. One of these groups expressed its views in the pages of an obscure Madrid weekly, La Conquista del Estado, in brackets, The Conquest of the State, end brackets, which had begun publication only a few weeks before the monarchy's collapse. Its editor, Ramiro Ledesma Ramos, son of a village schoolteacher, worked in the post office. One of Spain's many poor university graduates, Condemned to a threadbare existence in grubby clerical employment, Ledesma Ramos was fascinated by the German philosophy he had picked up at school. Despising demagogic nationalists as reactionaries, he tried to reconcile the German influence with a radical point of view that would be neither liberal nor Marxist. Ledesma Ramos liked neither the church nor the middle classes. Both were too backward, cosmopolitan, and selfish for his taste. He wanted a national workers' movement, which would adapt anarcho-syndicalism, the only native radical tradition of the country, to Spanish needs in a system which he called national syndicalism. What the small group of Ledesma's followers, in brackets, all students or university graduates in their early 20s, and brackets, had in common with anarcho-syndicalists was less ideas than a mood a common hostility towards capital which they claimed prevented any solidarity of interests between capitalists and wage earners, a common hostility, too, 
to Parliament, and to the institutions of the existing society. Being Spanish, they could agree with Bakkenin's extreme statement that personal liberty and dignity consists of obeying no other man and acting solely according to one's own convictions. Being poor and restless, they could endorse his advice that, in quotations, the present generation must indiscriminately and blindly destroy everything that exists, end quotations. Unlike the anarchists, however, they were not federalist and, above all, far from anti-state. They liked neither the right, which they considered much too backward, nor the left, which they found far too doctrinaire, to remedy Spain's stagnation and reconquer for her a worthy international position. They saw no other instrument than that of a reinvigorated state. The program they announced in the first number of La Conquista envisaged a new state which would be, in quotations, constructive and creative, end quotation, ready to, in quotations, supplant individuals and groups. The ultimate sovereignty will reside in it and only in it, end quotation. It was not certain quite how such an overwhelming power would reconcile itself with a syndicalist economy where the necessities of production would be owned in common by the workers through labor groups and, perhaps, free communes. But a unitary statism took precedence over syndicalist ideals. In the state they planned, the, in quotations, syndication of economic forces will be obligatory, and in each instance bound to the highest ends of the state. The state will discipline and will guarantee production at all times, end quotation. The fierce individualism of the anarchists was abandoned for a familiar elitism. In quotations, our primary goal is revolutionary efficiency. Therefore, we do not seek votes, but audacious and valiant minorities. End quotation. In effect, though he objected to the anarcho-syndicalists' lack of national sense, Ledesma Ramos liked their freedom from international connections and from bourgeois individualism. But the writers of La Conquista were trying to elaborate an ideology of their own, nationalistic, statist, imperialistically concerned with Spanish grandeur, calling for the expropriation of the great estates and the syndicalization of the masses. Although La Conquista soon disappeared because of lack of funds, its ideas would spread in university and right-wing circles and would coalesce with those of another small group founded about the same time as that of Ledesma Ramos's by the son of a peasant from Castile, Onisimo Redondo. During the late twenties, while attending a Catholic German school, Redondo had become acquainted with German National Socialism. As much of a Spanish nationalist as Ledesma, he approached the problem of Spanish revival from another pole. Ledesma came from the left, Redondo came from the right. His doctrine combined ideas borrowed from the Nazis with a fervent Spanish Catholicism, intolerant, chivalric, but also social. His review, Liberty, published in Valladolid, called for, in quotations, a movement steeped in true Spanish frenzy launched by the young and dedicated to combating at every turn not only the uncontrolled wave of materialism, but also the irresponsible hypocrisy of the bourgeoisie. End quotation. Although Ledesma's was radical and Redondo's was religious, both movements were weak, short of funds, violent, nationalistic, anti-bourgeois, and anti-Marxist. They would soon unite in the Juntas de Ofensiva Nacional Syndicalistas, in brackets, Committees of National Syndicalist Offensive, end brackets, or J-O-N-S, of which the yoked arrows of Ferdinand and Isabella were the emblem. And just as the Nazis and Rexists would take over the red banners of their enemies, the JONS adopted as their colors the red and black of Spanish anarchism. Jose Antonio The Johns were fated to slumber until a man of stature took their leadership, Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera, in brackets 1903 to 1936, end brackets. Jose Antonio, son of the late dictator, had little sympathy for aristocrats and property-owning classes to which he himself belonged by right of birth. 
because he knew they had made the most of his father's dictatorship only to let him down when he could be of no more use. His entry into politics, however, was made, and very naturally, as candidate of the right and champion of his father's memory. The first years of the Republic would give him food for thought, and, by 1933, his earlier views had been modified towards an authoritarian nationalism in which social reform played an important part. There was little definition of just what such reform might be, in brackets, apart from distribution of the land, end brackets, but an abstract idealistic vision, which by now we know as typical of fascist romanticism, in brackets, see reading number 6a, end brackets. In quotations, Fascism was born to inspire a faith not of the right, in brackets, which at bottom aspires to conserve everything, even injustice, end brackets, or of the left, in brackets, which at bottom aspires to destroy everything, even goodness, end brackets, but a collective, integral, national faith. A fascist state is not credited by the triumph of either the strongest or the most numerous party, which is not the right one for being the most numerous, although a stupid suffrage may say otherwise, but by the triumph of a principle of order common to all, the constant national sentiment of which the state is the organ. If anything truly deserves to be called workers' state, it is the fascist state. Therefore, in the fascist state, and the workers will come to realize this no matter what, the workers' syndicates are directly elevated to the dignity of organs of the state. One achieves true human dignity only when one serves. Only he is great who subjects himself to taking part in the achievement of a great task. End quotation. The Falange As a commentator pointed out, one had only to replace fascist by socialist to have a great many Marxists accepting such ideas. But José Antonio was no Marxist, as he proved by getting himself elected to the Cortés on a right-wing list in the elections of 1933. Except for a group of students enthused by his romantic rhetoric, the political movement he launched that same year, the Falange Española, was joined mostly by conservatives who followed him because he was his father's son. Whatever its program, no extreme right party was likely to flourish once the moderate conservatives won the elections of 1933. The moderate public and the great money interests had no particular inclination towards violent action or authoritarian doctrines, provided they could protect their interests by legal means within the framework of existing institutions. It was during these doldrums in 1934 that Falange Española merged with Johns, José Antonio becoming the United Movement's leader. Ledesma largely drafted the new Falange's program, which served to break the last connections with the conservative right, already alienated by a feeling that the Falangists meant what they said when they called for social justice, and that a national syndicalist regime would not be much better than the socialism they feared. While Falange's students exchanged blows and shots with militants of the left and lent a ready hand in crushing the miners' revolt in the Asturias, José Antonio established his hold on the movement, its syndicalist organizations, its sections of armed terrorists, excluding one after the other. Ledesma Ramos and Onisimo Redondo, who would lose their lives soon after in the Civil War. The doctrine he developed stressed the need for a revolutionary elite to carry out Spain's social and economic revolution, but an elite that would be self-selected by work and faith, and not by birth or education. No enthusiastic admirer of Mussolini or of Hitler, he stressed that the Falange was not a fascist movement, and that it had a Spanish doctrine of its own. In any case, as Stanley Payne remarks, the mass of phalangists had little or no idea of ideology. In quotations, all they knew of their program was that it was radical, ultra-nationalist, and stood for social reform. They knew that the party planned some sort of new economic order because José Antonio told them so, but they had only vague ideas about the nature of that order. Their enemies were the left, 
the center, and the right. They hated the left and the separatists most of all. End quotation. Anti-separatism for the Flangists was an article of faith. Only unity could make the country strong. Autonomy for Catalonia would mean decay for Spain. And separatism itself was often identified with policies of the left. But all this brought little support to the Falange. In the elections of 1936, opposed by both the left and right, José Antonio lost his seat. No other Falange candidate won one, and the party as a whole pulled only just over 40,000 votes throughout the country. The victors in the election were the Popular Front, a coalition of left-wing parties from communists to the center-left, and José Antonio's first reaction was to instruct his district leaders to avoid identification with the defeated right. What the Falanged hoped was that the revolutionary aspirations of the left might now be canalized by their nationalist influence. They even tried to patch up an alliance with the more nationalist-minded among the socialists. But these plans came to nothing, and the movement slipped back into the right-wing fold. Eager for the fruits of victory, some anarchists and socialists were taking things into their own hands, attacking property, particularly that of churches. This only confirmed conservative fears of a red terror they had no intention of accepting. As violence increased, political parties set up their own militias and, for a little while, funds flowed more freely into phalangist coffers, the movement's idealism and aggressiveness suggesting its potential role in the war of terrorism and counterterrorism that was beginning to break out. Leftist militiamen looked on the Falange as a dangerous enemy, while recruits from the right came to swell the Falange's armed bands. By March 1936, as murder and countermurder swept the streets, the Falange Española was outlawed for being, in quotations, an anti-constitutional party, end quotations, and most of its leaders thrown into jail. The party had to go underground, while murders and arrests continued at an increasing rate. The Rising and the Fall During this time, a number of army leaders were planning the rising which that summer led to civil war. From jail, José Antonio was involved in the discussions and the planning, as was the provincial leadership of the now underground Falange. But the generals and the colonels were determined to keep control of any insurrection, while José Antonio did not trust even their will to rise. When the rebellion came, in brackets, 17, 18 July, 1936, end brackets, the Falangists played their part, first as independent civilian auxiliaries to rebel army units, then in uniform. The party now became the leading nationalist political formation, its ranks swelled not only by nationalist enthusiasts, but by syndicalists and, in quotations, leftists, end quotations, who sought refuge from the persecutions of the right. But though it waxed in numbers, the movement had been decapitated. José Antonio and several other leaders would die or rot in the Republic's prisons. The survivors would be brought to heel by the army leaders. Two principal political organizations existed in nationalist territory, the Falange and the deeply Catholic, traditionalist followers of a Bourbon pretender to the throne, the Carlists, with their military formations called Requets. In 1937, these were fused by Franco's fiat in an artificial and theoretically absurd formation which bore the name Falange Española Tradicionalista y de las Yons. Clearly, as Franco put it in the decree that launched it, in quotations, a movement more than a program, end quotations, a movement under the personal leadership of Franco himself. In Italy and Germany, the party had conquered the state. In Spain, the generals who conquered the state conquered the party too, and turned it into a kind of zombie whose principal task would be to harness the workers to the chariot of their authoritarian rule. The old Falange leaders who survived were arrested, 
many were condemned to death and, though not executed, imprisoned, banished, or forced to take refuge abroad. Falange principles would be proclaimed, in quotations, the source of inspiration and the law of the Spanish state, end quotations. But the conservatism of Franco and the traditionalism of Carlist elements would give the party a very different coloring from that of 1934. It would fulfill its role as the party of the state, the docile, if sometimes resentful, instrument of Franco. In later years, young rebel groups would form within and outside its ranks, resentful of the new regime's stodgy conservatism and hoping to reaffirm the original national syndicalist ideas that the Caudillo had thrown overboard. Along with the Falange, Franco's regime kept much of the tone of José Antonio's speeches, but little of its spirit, if at all. Stanley Payne concludes that by 1959, in quotations, Falangissimo, as an organized living force, was entirely dead, end quotation. Spain looked to Marxism, or to the Church, with its wide diversity of orientations, but, though the Falange lived on, hardly to the Falange. The true Falangists have moved to other parties. Thus, in 1962, Dionisio Rudrejo, who many years ago composed the Falange's hymn and fought in Russia in the Spanish, in quotations, blue division, end quotations, and who is now a leader of Acción Democrática, was asked why, after having helped to found the Falange, he has become one of the regime's most determined opponents. In quotations, it is very simple, end quotations, answered Ridrejo. In quotations, when the Civil War began, I was 23 years old, and I believed in national revolution. Once victory had been won, I realized that I had helped a hardened oligarchy into power, so I began to fight it. End quotation. <laughs> 